Surprise. Even is now part of the permanent collection at the Rhode Island School of Design, as well as at the Christiana. This brochure, beautiful brochure, was printed at Rhode Island as a limited edition. Frank has been sleuthing about in the cosmos again, uncovering more of the mysteries of the universe that he will share some of tonight with us. Please welcome Frank Chesky. No, thank you. I'm uh, glad to be here. Um, see lots of familiar faces. This is great. Um, I'm going to show you new stuff. In that, I almost uh, could say I I turned a corner in my work. And uh, I'm going to try to share that with you. I've never presented this before. There's only a handful of people that have seen this. Um, and so I hope that I can present it well enough uh, for what it deserves because it's difficult to present. But it's based on um, the platonic forms, okay, are really important um, for all of us because they cover uh, ideas from all the way from the divine. Um, uh, intelligence that's beyond sight, sound, whatever, all the way down to the DNA in each one of us. And that's what these forms represent. So we're, they, all have, they all have a part of us, uh, and they've been studied for 4,000 years that we know of. And uh, in January 2000, this form was found, uh, and it's the first, um, it's the first of its kind and uh, I have found where it comes from. Um, that's what I've been doing for the past 12 years. It took me three months to discover it, but it took me 12 years to find out where it came from. And where, not only is it the, the physical heart, but, you know, where do these platonic forms come from? No one knows. Um, and th th uh, this form, okay, is, uh, and not an earth form. So it is a Rosetta Stone, okay, that has been giving me knowledge, understanding of something I can't see that's not related to earth. Okay, so it is a, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a code, and I, I've been listening to it for 12 years, and uh, I finally found basically where it comes from and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that's what I'd like to share. And of course, I want to share architecture uh, because um, uh, there were a number of people that wanted me to talk about it. But I need to tell you where it comes from before this makes any sense. So I hope that uh, you didn't think the whole talk was going to be on architecture. It is not. Uh, it's going to be about why that's important. OK. so. Um, to start off, I've been told that I should be more subjective. <laughs> and I thought I never should do that. So I should tell a little, some personal things. Now so I've decided to do that as today. And so um, one of the things that I did in my background was uh, when I was 13, I started engineering drawing using triangles and T-squares and drawing boards because of my dad. He was an aeronautical engineer. Um, and I taught engineering drawing for 19 years. Three periods of engineering drawing and three periods of art, both in the same room. And um, I majored in psychology and then I got a degree in not only psychology, but in art, with a minor in industrial arts. Because I wanted to know the machines. The art people don't know the machines. And they don't know how to use them and how to be safe with them or what, or what they can do. And then the industrial arts people, they don't have any design qualities whatsoever. They make the most boring things you've ever seen. So what I tried to do is to bring those two together for myself, not for anybody else, but for myself. So. Um, 
One of the things that's so interesting about the instruments that da Vinci invented for drawing, for mechanical drawing, are these triangles. And these are 30, 60 triangles, and the other triangle is 45. But um, if you drive up here, that's 30 degrees. If you drive up here, it's 60 degrees. And of course, this is 90. So if you take these two triangles and you put them together, they make a perfect triangle. Perfect. But I never really liked them like this. <laughs> I don't know, I just didn't. So what I always would do with them, drive the teacher crazy, is I would do this with them. And it made a kite. <laughs> now that, that's what I really like. And then I also realized that the kite that I'm holding is actually the same square area, okay, as the triangle. Same. You can't, you can't fight it. It's the same area. So this was a clue into when I started to work on the seven. I'm going to show you something that no, I've never shown anybody because there's so much for, in my research to find this. So what I found out was that if I take an equilateral triangle and put it here, I had an equal area here of a triangle and an equal area here of a kite. And that's what I wanted was a seven-sided form that had equal surface areas. So I knew I had a clue here with this, with these triangles. And uh, so uh, I made it three-dimensionally, it doesn't work. But it really gave me a clue because all I had to do is start doing something like this, okay, and it started to represent this more and more. So, um, then I found that I could make a seven-sided form. And I did it with the same triangles. Here they are in miniature. So what I did was I took this form here, I made this form based on those two triangles. But I did it with my kite. So to show you that that is accurate, that the two triangles make the surface, okay, of this face. And it also makes the surface of the other, th the other two. So there's one, two, three. Now when I made those three, on the bottom became a triangle where these points hit. And then, of course, since this is an angle, it makes other triangles. Do you see that? This is a seven-sided form. This has seven faces. This is what I was looking for, but the problem is, is I was just so stupid because I wanted to make everything equal. Uh, Patricia taught me how to, uh, these platonic forms are all equal, you know? So if I had just said, okay, I've got the seven-sided form, uh, then I could, you know, go out and ski or something. <laughs> but these aren't equal. I have to make these things equal. So, but it was interesting, what I did with these, that's kind of interesting, is uh, what happened with them, uh, this, this is really neat, what happened to these is if I put them together, okay, um, and remember this is very accurate, I put four of them together, I got the perfect tetrahedron. Now that's amazing. There are four seven sides forms to make a tetrahedron. Nobody knows this. And what's really neat is if I take this off and then there's this little tetrahedron. I'll show you this little tetrahedron in proportion to the bigger one. It looks like, like that. A little tetrahedron. Now what's neat about the little tetrahedron is he disappears. He's gone. <laughs> Now that little tetrahedron means that inside the core there's a tetrahedron. So that means that on the outside of this there's a tetrahedron and then a core and then a tetrahedron and a core. This will go on into infinity in both directions. Oh, well, this was really good, but well, that wasn't what I was looking for. So if I draw what I did here on the board, it looks like this. 
here is the way that everybody draws the triangle. Um, they do it like this. Well, I didn't do it that way. I did it like this. And that's what you just saw. That's understandable, right? You see, I want all of you to try the best you can to understand what I'm doing because if you don't understand it, and you can't understand it at all, of course, it took me 12 years, then you'll have doubt. Okay, and then you'll have to go on belief. Oh, I believe the guy, or I don't believe him. Try to stay with it. Try to stay with the, the lawfulness of all this so that doubt doesn't enter you. Okay, so what I did is the same thing I did with a five-pointed star. Uh, most, uh, you know, are like this, and then uh, people, oh, they go like this, and whatever, and so forth. I didn't do that. I did this. The same thing. I took the same protocol as I did here. So I went from the corner to the center, and I got a kite. That's what I was looking for with a kite. So here, here is the star, and here's, there are five kites. Do you see the kites? Now they come into the middle just like I wanted. Just like the triangle, they come into the middle. So what I did with those was I just fold them together like this, and I made four. And then I made three. That's the chestahedron. That's it. Simple. Over. That's all this chestahedron is, is three kites of a pentagram with a tetrahedron on the bottom. Now that's 12 years of work that I just gave you. How simple. You know, it's like, you know, simple, stupid. Uh, and it is. It's so simple, but look how long it took me to find that out, to give this simple explanation of how this works. So if I set this on a flat surface, there's a tetrahedron. That makes a tetrahedron. Okay, so now you know how it's done. Okay, now I'm going to get into these platonic forms. And I want to tell you that there are the problem with trying to find out where these come from is their order. Oh, this is fire, this is air, this is water, and this is earth. That's the, that's the elements that have been arranged since Pythagoras and Plato. Plato said, uh, this is the order. Uh, and it is. Absolutely it is. The last one, okay, is a dodecahedron. They say this is the you know, this isn't an element. They say this is the akasha, prana, uh, the ether. Uh, they have all these cosmic kind of things associated with this. Uh-uh. This isn't any of those. And I'll show you why. This is the mistake. And why it's a mistake is because these guys here and their relationship has, has made this in such a way that it loses the phenomenology of how they come in. And that's why the phenomenology has never been found, is because we use the elements to this. So of course, this is, this is the heart, this is the uh, uh, kidney, uh, and this is the liver, uh, and this is the lungs. Um, and it's also the elements. And there are all kinds of people who are interpreting this. But the problem with this is it's correct, but it's not the right order. Oh, that's a problem. That's why we've never discovered where they come from. And I'm going to put these down here in the front. So they're here that you can see. So we have fire, air, water, and earth. And of course, the more they're getting more contracted. This is the most contracted. This is supposed to be the most expensive. Hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, the Hindus work with the Platonic forms too. And they said um, that um, the cosmos, huh, the, the dodecahedron in 
the European style, okay, and the, and the Hindu people, they said this was the first form. That this is the, the being, uh, the divine essence of everything. Whereas the, the, on this side over here, they say it's a Okay, then they say that this is the father, okay. And then after that comes the mother. The mother is, I have to use this because I don't have enough of them. The mother is the dodecahedron. So they've reversed this part. Well, not really, but this is the mother. The, the third one that comes in, which is, uh, of course, these two make a union. Uh, and the third one that comes in is the tetrahedron. Remember, on that side, the tetrahedron is the first one. Uh, except they call it uh, a double tetrahedron. So I made it so you can see a double tetrahedron. Uh, what that means is, is that there are two tetrahedrons put together. And they consider this the dual, the duality. Yin and Yang. This is their idea. This is the Merkaba, that everything's being used now in meditations. That's the third one. This is Yin and Yang. The fourth one that comes in is the cube. And they say that the cube is the manifestation of everything in Earth. Okay, and that's kind of what we're saying too over here on the European side. And the last one is the uh, octahedron. On that side is air. They say this is the core of everything, and it's the crystal and also the pyramid. So we have these, these two, these two uh, uses. Now what I've found about all this is that these forms and the way they're transforming are based on concepts. They're not based on perception. They're based on thinking. They're based on, well, what do we do with this? Or what do we do with this one? Well, this is, uh, this is the cosmos. Um, or uh, this is the only thing that we can represent the duality in. These are concepts. These, are, these aren't perceiving the way these forms come in. And that's what's prevented this from being found. So I have to borrow this one on this side over here because I didn't want to make two of them. It's so hard enough making one of them. But here it is. Platonic forms are all based on contraction. Every one of the forms that you see in the front of here are not spiritual. They're contracted. They're on this side. They're not anything but contraction. And they don't want to state that, but it is contracted. All of them are contracted. Okay, so here's how they've done it in the past uh, to get these forms. They've used truncations. And truncations are pressure, either by pushing a point or cutting it off. Everything is being contracted smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so this is the logic that they took. They started with fire. They started with fire. And they cut the corners off. That's an Archimedean form. There's 13 of these. Kepler found them. Now how do you do it? You cut corners. <laughs> okay, that's fine, but that's not a platonic form, and why it's not is because these three surfaces aren't the same, are they, in size? They have to be the same size and area, just like this. It's the same size and area. This, although, has two uh, polyhedrons, or uh, that polygons, and different shapes, but they're equal. Okay, so what else we do on? We can take more corners off. So we take more off. And there we have the octahedron. That is the octahedron right here. This is how they did it. Okay. Now, you take the corners off this one. They're getting pretty small, so I didn't make it. But I did make the transitional form. 
See, this is fire. This is the transitional form between the two. Between here and the next one is this shape, which is a transitional form. And if I continue to cut the corners off, it turns into the cube. Whoa, this is not in order here. This is supposed to be over here. Okay. Now to get these things, I had to push the corners, push the corners, push the corners to get these shapes. Now if I continue to take this shape and push the corners, it turns back into this one. That's why it sits inside each other. So I've pushed the corners of a cube, it turns into an octahedron. If I take the octahedron and push those corners, it turns into the cube. That's known as a dual. So that means that right here, we're stuck. We can't go to this one, because all what happens if we press corners is it just keeps doing this. Well, how do we get over here? So, what I figured out, this isn't in the books. What I figured out what to do here was to change. Now we have points, lines, and planes, and then the third dimension, polygons. So, I couldn't use points anymore. So what I did was use lines, edges. So instead of pushing these, I pushed edges. Remember, points, lines. That makes sense, right? And when I did that, I got a dodecahedron. I don't see anywhere where they show that you push edges, you're going to get a dodecahedron. So to prove it, I'll show you how you do it. You take the cube, and you see all the gold lines on there? I push those gold lines. And the first thing that happens is this. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing this shape here. And if I continue to push it, it looks like that. Now you go from a cube to an octahedron, I'm sorry, a dodecahedron. Now if I continue to push on corners here, I get the icosahedron. No. Yes, yes, yes. If I continue, if I go back, if I stop, don't go to lines, but go back to pushing points, I get the icosahedron. Now that sequence that you see right there is not known. And look what's happened. It went from that size to that size. These are in scale. Okay, these are in scale. I made them in scale to each other, how they look. So we're going from the tetrahedron to the octahedron to the cube to the dodecahedron to the icosahedron. That's amazing. That's a whole new way of looking at these things. And this is, and that one over there has prevented it because this is based on concept. This is based on phenomenology. This is based on precept, not concept. Okay. So that's really a, a, a really major break is to realize where these are coming from. These are coming from each other. Points, points, lines, points, points. Okay. Now, all of that you've been described here is all on this side. On this side, the expansion side, okay, and there's many names that can go in here. As you know, there's probably a hundred names that you can put there. And um, where is this from? It didn't come in here. It's not a transitional form. It's not in between any of these. Where is it? There's a code here. There's a secret. There's a key that this is giving me and giving you. This is the first time this form has ever been here. So what is this trying to teach us? Okay, so how I found this, I showed you. 
but there's much more to it. I'm going to put these down here. Okay, so we start with the Europeans' fire. The tetrahedron. And the reason that you start with the tetrahedron, because it is the least amount of volume per area of any form. It's also known as fire, but I consider it a fulcrum. You know, a fulcrum is pointed just like that, with a, with a level over it that goes like this. This side is physical, this side is spiritual. This is also the Egyptian, how huh? they put a feather on this side and they put a heart on this side. Yeah. Anyway, here we go. How do I expand a form? Okay, so you can take a balloon and you can draw on the balloon the tetrahedron and you can blow it up and it gets bigger. Okay? But it's still a tetrahedron. So to expand the form, what I found was instead of going to points, I went to lines. And what I did was I opened it up like this. So simple. And as soon as I opened it up, a fraction of an inch, even a hair of an inch, or a millimeter or whatever, it's seven. This is now a seven-sided form. Even though these edges here are very close to each other, they make a kite. And the kite looks like this. Very small. And as I open it up, okay, as I open it up to different openings, it turns into this shape. So this line and this line come to the top and now you're going to think, well, how did he get that part? All you have to do is take the form, put it on something flat and it makes a plane. And if you follow the lines and where the planes go and turn it around and around, it can't do anything but be exactly where it's supposed to be. So this opening here this wide has to have that silver shape that size. So I've opened this up to this shape. Now this shape is not perfect yet. The areas are not the same. But if I open it up to 94.8 degrees and I have the mathematics behind this including the backing of the mathematical section at the Gerthiana that I have a perfect form. And for five years they denied it. Gave them the math and now they're best of friends. This is an equal surface form just like that. And you saw how I did it. I opened up fire. I opened up tetrahedron. I opened up into warmth. That's the process of fire. This is the process of warmth. Okay, so I still have to open this up more. And so when I open it up more, it looked like this. And now we have a tetrahedron or a triangle here and one on the top, one on the bottom, one on the top. Now remember, this is opening up this tetrahedron. Okay, and if I took these edges and I put them flat, okay, it makes it perfect. So you know it's lawful. And what's interesting about this is if I take it apart, the tetrahedron is exactly the same size we started with. And this is an octahedron. But look how much bigger. Okay, these are all expanded and the reason I know that is because not only of the size but I found out that how you look into this form is through dihedros. The way that I can go into this part of the world is through dihedros and dihedros are the angles that the two faces make. That's a dihedro. So if I turn it all to other sides, it's the same dihedro. 
Huh? You some of you know this. Okay, so wherever I put it, it's the same dihedral. Therefore, I know this is expanding logically, or it's correctly, or lawful. So, that means if I go and continue and open this up more, I need to use this, because that makes sure that I'm lawful. So when I open this up more, something happens that hasn't happened here. These are expanding, but all of a sudden, something happens here that was unexpected. So, I'll show you what happened. Now, I'm going to turn these like this. And you can see that the same size tetrahedron on all of them. Don't change any size. But when I go beyond this point here, I have to be real careful how I do this because you must be able to follow this because it's just unbelievable. You see, the one that opens up is there, right? Yeah. It's the opened up. It's opened up. It's a tetra. You didn't open up. And when I put it in here like this, it covers the bottom, doesn't it? So now you have four triangles that are all red. So if I open it up more, I'm still going to have the same triangles, aren't I? They're the same size. So this is what happened when I opened it up more. I opened it up a little larger than the last one here. And you can see, see if we can do this the same way. Um, this triangle here is this one. It's the bottom. But it's not flat anymore. It is imploded. It is going into a vacuum. The forearm is not, it's not out there anymore on a flat plane. It is now vacuum. And vacuum is sucking this in. It's sucking the form in all the way around. And yet this is still the same tetrahedron at the bottom. Same one. But now we have vacuum for the first time. Suction. Now how did he ever figure that out? And how did I figure out that that was going to do that? Well that's important to understand because I didn't understand it. But I kept my protocol, and my protocol was this. My protocol was dihedrals. So, here it is. Again, it is a seven-sided form. Again, it is a seven-sided form, except that it's turned upside down. Not interesting. It turned upside down. You see, these were all up. Look, up, up, and then all of a sudden, it turns upside down. Now I have to go back to my dihedral because the dihedral is the secret of making sure that it's lawful. So if I take this dihedral here, just like I did on the other one, my dihedral is accurate. So if I take the dihedral and start turning it around to the other sides, it must match. And it does. But it's poking out. Here too, it's poking out. See how that works? But in this place, it's contraction, not, not, not expansion. I mean, it's expansion, not contraction, which leads to a vacuum. And therefore, this point goes in, not out. These all come out. These are going in. So there is a suctional force in here. And so how do I make sure this is lawful that I just made? I just put it on here. To 
part that pokes out. Perfectly flat. Now I know exactly how much suction there is in this form because it's the same. One is coming out, one is going in. Thank you. Does that make sense now? The way I'm holding it? Okay. So that makes sense for this one, which was the first one that I have. Sorry. The next one is like this, a kite again, although it's bigger. And what's happening is that this is now getting bigger. This is now larger than this one. See how this is larger. Now what's so interesting is when this goes on, this line right here, no matter how far it goes up to the next form, it's always the same as these. And that's amazing in all of them. This stays the same. The only thing that changes is this length. Now to make sure that I know how far this goes up, I have to put it at a right angle. So the uh, protocol, two protocols. One is that you have to have a right angle. And you put the right angle on there, and there you go back to those little triangles that I had at the very beginning. I have one triangle up here, and one triangle here, and they're equal. They're equal in area. Same again. The same protocol I got with those triangles. Same one. And if I follow the dihedral, it tells me how much suction I have. It tells me how much it goes within. Okay, but remember, this is this is the protocol to use for these. Now this one I got right. Now I have to go on. The next one is this one. See the kite is always there. The kite is where the guiding force behind all of these forms is this kite. The thing that I originally said, look, kite's still there except it's turned upside down. But it's the same. And look what I'm coming up with here. What do you think that form is? This form is, if I get it right here, there's an icosahedron. That's this one. And it's based on these kites. Now, this is the most shocking part of this process that I found. It's what happens when I do the reversal. And the reversal is that I would take one of these off here and I put it on this form to show you that it's correct. Now remember, I checked the dihedral. Now here's that form. Yeah? I mean, I can. This is this form. Well, this is the symbol for water. Now, if I take this off, look at this form. All awful. This is water. What this means is that there's more suction in water than there is in any of the other elements, more than earth or air. There is a suctional force in water that goes 
into a space that is beyond nothing. This space right here is made by planes and inside there, there is a space that's less than a vacuum. So if you bring three vacuums together, what do you have when they overlap? If I put this on here, you'll see what I mean. You see how it overlaps the center? This is all lawful. That's why when I take it off, there's a space. Well, there is less than nothing in this point. And this is the first, okay, spiritual representation of suction on the other side that says that in water there is less than nothing. And there is a form. There is a form in here, which I know, that's not based on edges. It's based on planes. How can planes make a form that you can't see? This was, this is the most, I couldn't believe this when I saw this. I couldn't believe it's what it's doing. I couldn't believe it. It's the same as these. Okay, the next one I went to, I had to go a really a long distance because this kept reoccurring. But they got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they touched. Now where is the, where is the seven-sided form? It's right there. Now what's happening is the seven-sided form is bending at this point, right there. It is going across and then bends in. So that is where the suction is. This one also has the same kite. They all do. But to go where these points meet again, meet again the form looks like this. Suction again, except that these planes now touch. No gap. They touch. There's a the point. Okay. So if I go on, with this, let's see if I show you this. What's happening here? There's your kite, just like before. Now this kite point is going into infinity. Let's see if I have a piece that goes there. Maybe I don't. But I can take this piece and put it right on there, okay? and it becomes suction. If I continue to go, it looks like this. Same thing, same dihedral. The dihedral is probably more flat though, you see. almost flat. Look. Now if I make this into a, a kite or into the seven-sided form, I, goes, I don't know how far it goes up. I'm not going to make it, that's for sure. But then if I take this all the way out and I flatten this out, all of these forms are coming from a prism. A triangular prism, which is based on the three. And as soon as the projective geometry people tell you that two line, two parallel lines meet in infinity. If that's the case, this one, these lines will also meet. Therefore, again, is the seven-sided form. It's not 
a true seven-sided form and that's are equal surfaces. But the seven-sided form is going all the way through these, all the way to the tetrahedron. And that's where this form comes from. It comes from this side, suction. This form is based on suction, not on pressure. This happens to be the left ventricle of the human heart. You can go on a website, it's called not artistic science, it's called heartistic science.org. There's a lecture on there for two hours I gave and a whole bunch of papers. I read 50 papers on it, and you can read every one of them if you want. All right, so what do we have here? What do we have here? What is this saying? It's saying that in the spiritual world, These don't exist. These aren't in the spiritual world. Well, the cube, okay, okay, is related to us because we are on the planet Earth. And what does this represent? This represents to me 12 human beings. Six males, six females and the struggles that we go through into the three-dimensional world. Okay, this has not had anything to do with Akasha or the etheric or anything like that. This has to do with human beings being human. And this, okay, comes from this one. And this one turns into this one. So these are both earth forms. Now in spiritual world, what we found was here, is that everything is triangles. They're all triangular. Okay, there's no squares and there's no pentagrams. There are only triangles. And they're based on dihedros. So, I say that the Rosetta Stone that I have found that goes through all forms is a seven-sided form, not that one. But it has seven sides. Even the tetrahedron has four sevens in it. So, on this side you can see the seven-sided form. On this side you can't, but it's there. Here it is in the octahedron. You can't see it, but it's there. It makes the octahedron. It makes it. But it's not there, you can't see it. But the seven is still there because there is a spiritual force that's coming into this world, okay, that has a form. Here it is in the icosahedron. The seven-sided form is right there. You can see the kite. There's the kite. There's the other kite and a third kite. And on the bottom, there's the tetrahedron that opened up. But it's gone. You don't see it. On that side, you see it. On this side, you see it. On the expansive side, on the contractive place, you don't see it. It's there. And the dodecahedron is there too, but it's completely inside. So there it is there. And in the bottom, there are the three again. They're yellow. Those are the three, or I'm, I'm sorry, the four that makes the uh, tetrahedron, and the tetrahedron opens out until it hits the face, the exact middle of the pentagon, and then goes up to the very point, and there is your seven-sided form again, in this form. So what this is saying is that this seven-sided form is a structural element both on both sides. It's like a skeleton. And in the cube, there it is there. It fits into a cube. It has the yellows, the four yellows, and then the blue kites. And what's so amazing is that one this is exactly the same. Let's see if I have it here. Maybe not. I do. This is the same form. Which has a tetrahedron in it and an octahedron on the bottom. It fits into a cube, 
And now here comes the last one, which is the icosahedron. I'm sorry, the tetrahedron. Here's the tetrahedron. There it is. It's in the tetrahedron. Perfect. Look at it. The same seven-sided form. Perfect in the tetrahedron. All of them. Now we know where this is on this side. We know where this is. It's an opening up. It's between fire and air. That's where this form is between these two. Which of course in this case is the tetrahedron. Well, it's the balance between fire, but on this side is warmth, and air, on this side is light. That's where the seven-sided form is perfect of the human heart sits. On this side. But on this side, it doesn't appear. It's supposed to be here, and the problem is, is where is it? How, how, how does it come in? How does this become in here? It takes a tetrahedron and a cube. If you take the tetrahedron and you put it into a cube and you vortex it, you spin it, just the way all the trees come in, all the way the plants come in, all the tornadoes, everything is coming in through vortexes. In a cube, the tetrahedron vortexes into the seven-sided form perfectly and it goes all the way to the middle, right up here, which is the octahedron or this one. This one isn't on this side. It's over there. But if you put it in the cube, which represents Earth, and you put fire into Earth, and you vortex it, you now have the seven-sided form, perfect, on this side. And this is the heart. So what that means is that this form, and no other form, which is very interesting, this form, okay, can speak to this side. Because it has the same form. This form is over here, on this side, and this side is the contracted form. There they are. They're the same. So here they are together. This is we can call it whatever, the theric, you can call it the expanding, whatever. But this is the correct proportion between these two worlds, this one and this one. So what it's saying is that through our heart, we can connect to the other side. Through our heart, not through our brain. We have to have a thinking heart. And there's all kinds of stuff about the doctors are saying that there's all kinds of these things and synapses and so forth and so forth in the brain, also in the heart. Well, that may be true. I don't know about that. But there is a form. Okay, I'm showing you that there is a logical, a perfect form, a perfect seven-sided form that speaks the spiritual world through us, through our heart. This is the first time that heart thinking has been proven in a lawful way. The other way is subjective. This is objective. You can't fight it. It's there. You can't fight the process because it has a protocol, and this has a protocol too, and we've been using it. Except that in 2000, January, I found this form. So as something came in in 2000, January, something came in to bring this form in here because this form, okay, is there's this picture of this guy that looks into the spiritual world and he's kind of on his knees and he looks through this, this surface and, and there's a the spiritual world there and he's still on his knees looking out from the, uh, the, the earth and looking at the spiritual world. Remember that photograph or that drawing? I didn't do that, okay? What happened was I was working at my desk and some thing dropped this on my desk. I said, hey, let's see what you can do with this. Kind of like that. This is coming from the other side. Not from me. It's coming from the other side. And I was assigned this, and I was taught how to do all of this stuff so I could do all of these things. And that's why I came here. I came here to develop this form in such a way that I could understand it and I could explain it to you. And my whole background leads up to, I won my first, my first award 
I won for the biggest kite. Now I'm 10 years old, about this high, and I've got this big kite that's about 16 feet high. My mother couldn't even take it in her car. I had to drag it to school, and I won first prize. <laughs> but even then, on the 10th, I was 10 years old, I was working with a kite. And then I went into this drawing here and so forth. So that was a background that we all have. We all have this background in us that we have here something that we can come to do. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there is something happening in 2000, okay, that this happened. Because this has never been here. Never. And that's amazing. It's only seven sides. But it's absolutely perfect. It's so beautiful. The Gerthianum for five years rejected this work. Okay? And then the mathematical section said, uh, no, no, it is correct. And now they're, uh, they're uh, asking for a $15,000 grant to hire two students to work with Oliver Conrad on this form for six months. Okay, and they're going to do all the kind of stuff that the mathematicians like to do after something is discovered. <laughs> but I need that. I need that book. I need that, I need that research. And it's very, very important. So m this is my responsibility to bring this in. And of course, if the anthroposophists do not use this form, other people are going to. They're already started. There are beekeepers already working. There's people in the Philippines. There's even a person putting them on t-shirts. Okay. There, uh, there are mixers. Okay. Uh, the application that this form has is unbelievable. There it is in architecture. Okay. And that drawing on the end there is coming out of the seven-sided form. And that 13-sided star right there, there's 13. Okay, this one here, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the 12. Okay, this form is basically what Rudolf Steiner said was an Egyptian initiate. And so I made that three-dimensional, here it is. This is that form right here. Because I know how to make things three-dimensional. There's that form right there, exactly. Because it comes into three dimensions from two kites. And these two kites are 60 degrees opposed to each other. They're coming from two kites. So there's a whole new world here because all of these kites were even. They're only one, I'm sorry, all these kites were only one kite. There was only one kite here. But really, there's a whole new feel of using two kites and bringing them together. And now if you look at this star, what's amazing is this star here, okay, is basically what you see in the, in the drawing. But then, because of this shape, the other side looks like this. And, and it looks like the star, is, its shoulders are kind of moving up. It looks like it's maybe in more flight. And if you take both of them, there's a star here and a star here. And I've got my fingers on both the points. You have to ask yourself, do you see both stars at the same time? You see one star, now you see this star. You see this star? You see this star? Can you see them both at the same time? No. This is the kind of meditation that we have to go into because we have to be able to see two extremes, okay, that are related at the same time. That's what the heart wants. The heart wants to be able to see two views opposing each other, one upside down, one spreading up, one more contracted, at the same time. And that's what that star is giving me. This bell here, I finally had the money to make it. This is the, the Chestahedron and this bell. These are, Angus Gordon bought this. This is, uh, he, he didn't buy that one. He, he made one this high. Patricia was at the conference. He recasted it. Well, I guess that's now all right. He is buying bells for all the welfare schools in England. That size. This one is sold to a Camp Hill community in New York. This is sold. And the thing is, is that it's being suspended without a handle at the top. So that means that it doesn't have a damper on it. It's not being dampened. So it vibrates like no other bell can vibrate because it is full. So what I did was I designed a way to do that. So what I did was suspend it, okay, at one point, and then put the clapper on, on this little part here. 
And now I can ring the bell. It's heavy. It's bell bronze. This is the Venus bell, okay, because this is the Venus seal, if you look at it. Anyway, I've made two of them. I've made a Saturn bell and a Venus bell. Now one's sold. So, and here it is in motion. This form in here is taking and doing the traditional way with points. If you push the form, the seven-sided form with points, here, you get another form. But the problem is, is that you can't just push points. You have to push edges too. So this is the first time there's a lawful way of pushing points and edges at the same time, and that turns into this form. I think I have it here, one of these here. Here, here it is. This is called a decatria. It's the first 13-sided form like this ever. There is no other 13-sided form in the world. And what this is, is the 13. So, you have the 12, and the bottom is a triangle. So, of course, the 13th is considered the Christ and the 12 disciples. This is all in one form. And there's only one triangle in this whole form. And that is the one that's in the middle. That's this one. When it moves. You see it? How about now, no? I want you to see it. How about there? But if I stop it, you can see that this one is the decatria inside the seven perfect. There's a whole new research here to go on, a whole new area to go into for anybody. Okay, so this is what the building is all about. The building is all about the chestahedron, the perfect form, the seven-sided form, with the decatria outside of it. Because I was told in the Grothianum that if I could find the form that went around the seven-sided form, that would be the form that reconstructs the heart during the night when we leave. Makes sense, it would be 13. There is no 13-sided form because there was no seven-sided, like this. So what I did was I found out that there was two spheres. And those two spheres I found out through taking the form, the seven-sided form, and finding out where the center was. Now I don't see that form, so it may not got, have gotten here. But uh, believe me that the inside of the form the center of this triangle and the center of this triangle makes these two circles. And if I have where the seven comes into the five, here's the five and here's the seven where they come into, that creates that star. And that star, okay, is based on the center of this form. So there's a sphere here and a sphere here, and there, the two spheres are five and seven. The Gertheonum's two cupolas are five and seven. They're the same number ratio. The only problem is, is that Rudolf Steiner was five across the diameter. This is five across the circumference. Okay, so um, inside here I have bells. There are seven bells on posts that run down the middle. Okay, because Rudolf Steiner said that the seals were frozen music. So when I pulled them up, I interpret them as bells. So this goes on and on. This architecture here is not built. There is no place for it. There's no one's going to do it. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay, it's here. But I will tell you why I designed it, because that is where the grail study should be taking place. That's where people should be studying the heart, because it's in a heart. And that is related to the spiritual world. You're going to have connections there that you're not going to have in a regular building. And that's why I did it. And of course this front cupola is, is for the arts, it's an art gallery. The whole thing is for arrhythmia, uh, 
mystery plays, drama, lectures, concerts, and so forth. That's what I designed it for. So, why should I make an effort to do something like that that's not going to, doesn't have plans to be built anywhere? Because that's what I'm going to do, that's why I'm here. To do these kind of things. Well, um, I, I guess I can answer questions, I, maybe. Uh, it's time. My time's up. So if you have any questions about all this, uh, this is, I didn't even have this when I went to RISB, the Rhode Island School of Design, and that, they told me, they said that when you're ready and you're not doing this anymore, we want all the work. Because we will have a whole building for all your work to be displayed on forever. They'll keep it as an archive. Now this is the best, highest rated art school in the world, in the United States. They own this, they own this. and so does the Garthiana. So this is a bridge between those two worlds, between the art and depth, and depth and art. And that's again the balance that we have to do in the heart. So that's why I'm doing this. I got lots more to go. Um. <laughs> you know, thank you for inviting me here because, you know, if it weren't for the branch, I wouldn't be here. All these years, for 12 years, you've been inviting me here. Don't tell me I get to come here. So I really appreciate the branch. And also, of all the different branches I've gone to, it's not a lot. But I've gone to many of them. This is the most active and the strongest. Really. Daniel Bilson has a good one. What kind of building materials would be appropriate for this structure? Well, you know what's neat about what you just asked is the materials. Now, what's neat is that the color on the building is not on the building. The color is completely free of the surface because all of the glass on the outside is causing those colors. And that stained glass on the outside, Ronald, is based on tourmaline, the tourmaline crystal. And the tourmaline crystal, it's the Christ stone. And it's, if you take a tourmaline crystal and you cut sections off it like salami, and you put it up to the light, that's what color it is. And so all of this right here, okay, all of this color is not on the form. The form is free of color. So during the day, it will change colors as the sun goes around, and also at night, the way it's lit. So the material, okay, uh, these are nylon that go all the way around. So when the wind goes through it, it will be a wind harp. It will be a largest musical instrument. It can even be played with bows or plucked. Pizzicato. Um, uh, this is stained glass that goes all the way around. It's divided into the zodiac, and I use the colors that Rilla Steiner indicated for the zodiac. Uh, so, Ronald, I'm not sure about the material. Uh, I do know that it's not concrete. Okay, it will have to be a lighter material. Now, in the old days, they used pumice, yeah? And they carved pumice, yeah? And then they put a, a paint on both sides of it and made it very, very light. So it's gonna have to be a modern light material. Um, and the reason I put this uh, netting here was to break up the light so it's not too harsh to take away from the colors being reflected. And also, this angle from here to here is the exact balance of the internal structure of the myofibers in the human heart. They're at 45 degrees. I don't know if that helps, Ronald. Go ahead, you have to repeat that, because they, they for sure can hear. Oh, how did you arrive at this architectural form through the seven-sided form? Is that what you're asking? And also, how did it, uh, and how did you see it as a musical instrument as well as a building? Well, there's this one guy that came to my lecture I gave in, in San Francisco to the doctors for two, two days. And this guy made a wind harp out of the chestahedron. 
Okay, and I have it on my website. If you want to go on my website, frankchester.com, look on, on contributing artists, click on that and you'll see a bunch of people that I put on there that's done something with this. And he is selling this wind harp to Stanford for $45,000. The wind goes through it, yeah? And stainless steel is big and it actually rings. So that's where I got the idea. But mine is based on 12 because of the zodiac. So I've made this, those, those uh, strings are based on 12 all the way around. So I mean, uh, it's kind of like that. That's how I did it. Now remember that this is subjective architecture. I mean, objective ar architecture. Although I am a person, I'm a human being. Okay, and so I have to say that yes, Frank Chester did that. Yes, I, that's true, I did. I had a lot of help. But I had to be strong to do this. I have to be strong to come, be coming in front of you and present such these wild ideas. But they're lawful, so it's a lot easier than you think. No, no, they are not. This is such a happy form. And I put this on, the, on my carpet, it looks like it just wants to hop around. It's so happy. And what I really like about it is that, see this right here? That's Superman, right? <laughs> but he's a delightful, uh, Angus Borden bought one this big for his field center and all of the forms that shows how it came in and how it went in both directions from the chestahedron to the decatria back to the chestahedron. He bought all of those forms. This guy has really supported me. Social implications around this new knowledge. You see some social Im implications? Around? This new knowledge. Well, I mean, the building is a, is a social gathering of people who are interested in studying the heart, okay, and in relationship to heart thinking. I think the research in that building could be outstanding and it could be people coming from all over the place. It's like, it's not like the Gertianum, of course, but it is a center where people could come together to study, okay? It would be just a fantastic thing to do, have researchers coming in and all the time. But it'd be based on grail studies. Not based on making mixers or making beehives. So that's not what it's all about, okay? But it's the actual, the social part that Vasag is talking about, which is very important. Yeah, is there a school that people can go to that are interested in this sort of knowledge? That you could get this kind of knowledge? Yeah. Well, I mean, I started out here and Dennis's class with Patricia, Patricia is what introduced me into the botanic falls, okay? Uh, I mean, I just listened until she came in and oh my gosh, I went home and that was it. <laughs> um, so, uh, mystery schools, what you're asking for, they're mystery schools, you know, uh, and mystery schools are, you know, this is magic, but it's not magic uh, it it's, has mystery behind it. It seems magic, but it's not magic because it's lawful. Okay, so what we're interested in in, in going to study is in the mysteries. Okay, so you go to school to learn something and then you need to get the heck out. Okay? And you need to leave school. The school is over, okay? And you take what you can from it, and from then on, you're on your own. And that's the hardest thing that being human has to do, is to be able to take up your own work, okay, without the reliance of some guru or some instructor or some, some uh, institution. Okay, so I would say that the best place to go to do this would be inside you. That would be the best place to go. You are the best university or school there is. And you, you bring with you, okay, what you bring with you, okay, is your schooling. Whether you know it or not. I didn't do this till I was 60. I'm really slow. But it's okay because it did come. 
going to come to all of you. You have to listen. Yeah? You have to be patient. You have to be strong. But you also have to be giving. And you have to fail. You have to fail and fail and fail again. All of this looks like I didn't fail, but I did. I failed plenty of times. It didn't work. Why not? I had to go home and figure it out. I had to go to sleep and figure it out. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff came at me. I had this dream, okay, where I was in this big room like this, and there were all this kind of beings, the people who were in there, you know, and they were passing that form around, and I, yeah, this is what we've been looking for. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I don't, that's a dream. I and mean, maybe that's wishful thinking. But um, it did happen. It, is, it was a dream. So I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have had that dream if I hadn't made that star. I wouldn't have had it. So I wish I could tell you a school. The best school to go to, okay, this is, this is how, let me, answer, let me answer it this way. Whatever school you go to, you're going to have good instructors and you're going to have crummy ones. Absolutely any school. Any school. So when you go to school, find out, go in the cafeteria and ask the people in the cafeteria, hey, who's good in this? Is somebody really good here? Yeah, this person's really good. Take that person. I don't care what the course is all about and what you're required to take. Forget the requirements, whatever. Take from the best instructor there is in that school. That's what you want to look for. The degree, what are you going to do with that? But get a job, you know. I mean, I got one. <laughs> but I mean, you know. Good advice. But I did take I did take the 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 courses I wanted to, and I know Jordan over here. He just made his own schedule and took what he wanted and what he wanted to major in, and he was able to do that. And I think today schools are more flexible. So the SOG, you can whatever you find, yeah, whatever you find. See, what I would like to do is have a building like that, or even just a Quonset hut, where I could have people come in, okay, and I could, I could give them things to do like this, but I can't because I just have my living room. And I've been working in my living room for 12 years. But if I had a bigger space, okay, then I could bring in all kinds of people that could work and give them assignments and, and try to get them off on their own, get them out of the doors just as quick as they got in. Do you have any of an idea of what kind of a working back on the human being would happen inside these forms? Because I think the architecture now has uh, come so far, but it doesn't really know how to go into the future. It doesn't. It you, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, architecture is still subjective. Look at what happens. You go to all the Waldorf schools and what do you see? You see the architecture with cut off corners. Okay, and that's what the real estate did. Everybody cut off the corner, but hey, man, look at that was how many years ago? So, architecture, okay, is, boy, a wide open field for something new. And, and, it, and, and it should be subjective. Here, this is what I think. All architecture projects should have two beings who take care of it. One is an architect, an, an artist. And you have got to have a structural engineer right along with them. Because the artists, okay, they don't learn structure. Uh, they pass the test, but they don't work off structure. And so they're kind of loose. Some of these things fall down. And then, <laughs> no, it's true. And then on the other side, you have structural engineers, okay? And they overbuild everything and they're ugly and stunned. And, you know, three, five, six hurricanes going to hit it, will never move. But, so you need that balance between those two. That's spiritual science. Everything's spiritual science, really. That's really all the time we have for this evening. Our time is up. Okay. Really. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, people. Thank you. Thank you. The, oh, the stuff. Hey, who, who introduced Angus to you, man? I don't know. Where's my I'm, commission? I don't know. I, wait, I, wait I a minute. Have to, have to How many out, forms so. did you sell him so yeah. far? <laughs> wait a minute. I saw the bell. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we ought to be bringing some of these here. Very long, very narrow. That's what this is. That's the yeah. basis of these forms. Yeah, it is that kite yeah. shape.
And Thanks for coming, Ron. The website you were mentioning that you have your papers on? Heartistic dot org. Okay. Just like heart. Just no, it's like heartistic. Heart Not like. I'm sorry. Heartistic science dot org. Two words. Heartistic. Not artistic, but heartistic. Science dot org. Hey, how you know?